To God be the glory. Amen? I'd like for you to turn your Bibles, if you would, to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'll be there in a few minutes. I'm going to go through a few other things first. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Title of my message this morning, Will You Pick Up Paul's Christ-Given Message? Will you pick up Paul's Christ-given message? Last week, we showed the importance of individual believers today of rightly dividing the word of scriptures to know what it means in time past, but now the ages to come. And when you realize the but now is Romans through Philemon's, you begin to realize what is specifically given to you and how you are to believe and live the Christian walk. So I want to challenge you today to pick up on that truth, pick it up, make it a part of your life. Now, when saved, we have some changes that take place. I'm grateful for that. We have a change of standing before God. The moment you put your faith in Christ and the finished work of Christ is at that moment you are justified, the Bible says. You are in heaven's legal court. You are declared righteous. I don't understand that, but I'm grateful for it. Amen. And so we are justified and we are accepted. The Bible says we're accepted because we're in the beloved. We're in Christ. And because of that, God accepts us. And sometimes I think, as uh, I think Flora was singing, I, I think to myself, why me? <laughs> why in the world would God reach down and touch somebody like me? You ever feel that way? I think you need to look at it that way at times. And then something else when we're saved, we have a change of nature from God. We have our old nature or our flesh but now we also have a divine nature in the sense that our spirit has been made alive, resurrected, and God himself takes up residence and he lives inside of us. Now, before the old man had control of us, but with this new spirit that's come alive and with the person of the Holy Spirit living inside of us, the battle begins. <laughs> And it's a battle of putting off what is wrong in our life and putting on what is biblical and correct in our life. And it's a real battle at times, isn't it? Because the old flesh is very, very strong. But also, we have a change of mind about God. The Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We are to renewing of the mind. And God wants us to change our thinking according to what the Word of God says. Now, I remember when I was first saved at 24, I remember the pastor who won me to Christ, I, he was preaching a revival. And uh, I went to the revival, and, and I remember the distinct difference of hearing him previously and then hearing him after I got saved and what he was saying, it's like the words were jumping off the pages at that moment. Has that ever happened to you? And uh, it was just a wonderful thing, a change of mind about God. And then also there's a change of life for God. Uh, when you get saved, it's from our own will to God's will. Uh, it's his life now living in me instead of my own life. He wants me to exchange my life. He wants me to die to self and live for him. And I've said before, is that reasonable? That's what Paul said. It's more than reasonable. When you consider what he has accomplished for each and every one of us who have been saved. And then also there's a change of family of God. You remember when the Lord said to those Jewish people even... Uh, part of Abraham, he said, you are of your father the devil. <laughs> you see, we are children of God by faith in Christ, Galatians 3.27. Not by membership, not by water baptism, not by giving my money, not by living the Ten Commandments, 
but by faith alone in the gospel alone. That's the only thing that can save us today. And when you get saved, God says, listen, flee from youthful lusts with them that call on God out of a pure heart. And God wants us then to begin to run with other people who are just like that, our family. It's interesting that regardless of who you are when you meet one another because you've been saved, there is a family connection in there. There's just something special between brothers and sisters in Christ. And then there's a change of place and position in and with God. Today, the Bible tells me, I don't understand it all, but he says, I'm seated with Christ in the heavenlies. Before, we were in Adam, but now... We're in Christ. And because we're in Christ, he's seated on the right hand of the Father. That means my position, I'm seated on the right hand of the Father even at this very moment. It's hard for me to comprehend that, but that's what the Word of God says. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. You're no longer in Adam in sin on your way to hell. You've been taken out of that, and you've been placed in Christ. Now you're a child of God. Now your sins are forgiven. Now you're on your way to heaven. That's because you're in Christ now. Thank God for that. And then also, there's a change of responsibility and accountability to God. Once you get saved, we have the responsibility to stand up for God's truth. We believe in the whole Bible, but we also believe in a particular way that for the body of Christ today, he gave us some special instructions that's only found in the Apostle Paul's epistles. It's such a privilege to be able to have God hold me accountable and I'm responsible to stand up for his truth. Now, it's not always easy, is it? Galatians 6, 9 says this here, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. That word weary there, sometimes you get tired in the work. Sometimes you get tired of the battle that rages and the attacks and everything you have to go through to stand for truth, and you get weary at times. No one said it would be easy, and especially God. (laughs) And there are times in your walk as a believer you feel like, You're all by yourself, and it's discouraging at times when you stand for truth. Standing for truth means you don't do what culture and society is saying what is correct today. Uh, You go by what the Word of God says is correct. And so sometimes that gets discouraging when you see so many going by the way of Cain, in a sense, going by the way of secular society. And it's frustrating at times. I understand we live in a world that is an evil place. Galatians 1.4 says this, Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. Now, this is not a nice place that we live in. And boy, if that hasn't been seen the last six months, you haven't had your eyes open. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It's a wicked and evil place out there. And the Bible says friendship with the world is enmity with God. You're an enemy of God if you're a friend of the world, he says. And we believers with the truth, we just don't fit in, do we? We don't fit in with the world, with Christendom. They're against who we love, what we proclaim. They could care less what we believe. Uh, A lot of you probably saw this week where Tim Tebow was taken off Twitter. And uh, I I looked at the video, by the way, and all he said was that uh, if you're going through deep waters right now, you're going through a tough time. It's been a bad week, month, six months, the pandemic, all these things. There's one person that you can rely on and you can lean up on God. And uh, he loves you. And he proved that love by sending his son to the cross for your sins. And he says, so during this very difficult time, why don't you lean up on him? And they took him off Twitter saying it was too sensitive. 
Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. And these big tech giants are going to try to begin to control the conversation and point it to what they agree with and try to silence many, many voices. Our First Amendment is eroding right before us in our own country, isn't it? But we don't trust the First Amendment. We trust God. And we'll just do what he wants us to do. Amen? When we stand for God and truth, it often gets lonely. It gets bumpy. But we have to stand up for what we believe. Uh, I give a little list from time to time because I don't want us to ever forget. I want it to go into our brains so we don't forget. We believe in inspiration of the scriptures. From Genesis through Revelation, we believe it's the very word of God. And uh, we believe every word. As a matter of fact, we believe it's been not only inspired, we believe it's been preserved. And for the English-speaking people, we believe it's the King James Bible. So that makes us radical. Isn't that interesting? Because we believe we have the very word of God. And yet they will criticize us for that. Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, a furnace of earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. God's given us a promise that we will always have the word of God. And the reason we believe the King James Bible is the best English-speaking Bible available in existence or ever will be is the, is the fact that God promised that he would preserve them and they come from the proper text. There's a real battle between God's text that he's preserved and corrupt text that takes away from the deity of Christ, from the inspiration of scriptures, even creates work salvations. Anymore, you can make all of these versions mean what you want them to mean just by going to a different version rather than the old standard. Now, you might not have liked what I just said, but I just say to you, tough, amen. <laughs> now, we believe in dispensations. We're in the dispensation of grace. It began with the Apostle Paul in mid-Acts. And we believe God dealt differently in time past than he does with the time of grace today, but now. And so it'll be different when in the ages to come. He'll deal differently with those individual peoples. You can't understand the truth of the Word of God until you get your dispensation straight. That's real simple. We believe salvation is by faith alone, in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. There's no other way to get saved today. You have to acknowledge you're a sinner. You have to believe that Jesus Christ is God's son who came, who died for your sins, who was buried and took your sins far away, who rose again victoriously, proving that the Father accepted his sacrifice on the cross as sufficient payment for all of our sins. Now, let me just say, there's large groups today that say that the cross is not enough. They say he had to go to hell and suffer in hell and be born again in hell to be able to be risen from the grave. And some of the popular people you follow believe that garbage. They're saying the cross was not sufficient, and we defend the cross is more than sufficient. Amen. That's good preaching, Jimmy. Now... We believe in the security of the believer. Once saved, always saved. Uh, we believe once you come to Christ, there's no way of getting out of Christ. Now, that's not license, but that's confidence. Amen? That's assurance. And when you have assurance, you can do better for Christ. Uh, I don't know if I've told where they were trying to paint years ago the Golden Gate Bridge. And a lot of fellows were falling off to their death. So what they did, they created this great big net underneath them. And uh, they only had a couple deaths after that, and hardly anybody ever fell anymore because they had confidence they had a net. And boy, we have a net, the finished work of Christ. And so we have security. We believe in godly living. Uh, grace does not mean license. Grace works in us to be holy. 
You know, and the way grace is different is that some people work because they have to, it's their duty, whereas grace creates a desire within our hearts, we want to be what Christ wants us to be. And there's a difference. We believe in the deity of Christ. We believe he's always been the eternal son of God. Never was a time where he was not the eternal son of God. Amen. And he's God. Thy throne, the father says to the son, O God. The father calls him God. (laughs) And so we believe Jesus Christ is deity. We believe in the second coming of Christ. It's going to come in two phases. The first phase, the next event, is the rapture or the calling up, the going up of the body of Christ in its fullness to meet Christ in the air. And when we're in heaven, the judgment seat taking place, here on earth, there'll be a seven-year tribulation period where God pours out his wrath upon mankind and Israel, one-third of them, will believe that Jesus Christ is Messiah. And at the end of that tribulation, Christ returns in his second phase, returns to the earth, defeats Israel's enemies, judges the nations, and they go into the kingdom. But we believe Jesus will call us up very, very soon. Also, we believe that Israel has a future kingdom. One day, Christ will be sitting on a throne. One day, David's throne will be there. And they will be a kingdom of priests. And they will have favor amongst people because they will be ministers of God. Israel has a future. And then also, we believe the body's mystery truths revealed to Paul are found in his epistles, Romans through Philemon. We also believe for one to be saved, they need to be spirit baptized. Today, there is only one baptism, and it's not water. Water can't clean one lick of a thing. Amen? But the spirit baptism I'm talking about is when he takes you out of Adam and baptizes you, places you into the spiritual union body of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit are, and I get this, are we all, we who have believed, baptized into one body. He says in Romans 6, 23. Know ye not so as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. That baptism there, that's not water. You can't, water can't place you in Christ. Only the spirit of God can place you in Christ. It states in Galatians 3.27, For as many uh, of you as have been baptized, spirit baptized, into Christ, have put on Christ. Colossians 2.12, Buried with him in baptism. That's spirit baptism. Wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Ephesians 4.5, One Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's only one baptism today during the body of Christ, the dispensation of grace. What baptism is that? That's spirit baptism. 1 Corinthians 1, 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Baptism has nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? So after we're saved, we're commanded, we're challenged to stand for God's truth. It's been said that those who won't stand for something will fall for anything. Today, our apostle is Paul. Not the 12, it's Paul. Romans eleven thirteen. 13. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify mine office. He's our pattern. He's our example. And Paul said this to us. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. Prove all things, hold what? Fast that which is good. He says in 2 Thessalonians, can't talk, 2, 15. I'm speaking in tongues, and I don't even believe in tongues. <laughs> Therefore, brethren, stand fast. Hold the traditions which you've been taught and so on. No, stand fast. 
That means to hold fast, to hold on to the truth, to seize it, to keep that truth, to retain that truth, to possess that truth, to stay with it, to maintain its memory, to not let that truth go. That's his challenge to us. Paul experienced for standing for that truth, 2 Corinthians 11. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in uh, perils of mine own countrymen, Jews, in perils by the heathen, lost people, in perils of the city, in the wilderness, in the sea, among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watching off, watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without that which cometh upon me, daily the care of the churches. Who is weak? I'm not weak. Who is offended? And I burn not. Paul went through all of that so he would hold fast. He not only had to suffer that because he held fast, but he suffered that because he did hold fast and would not let it go. Paul would not compromise nor let truth slip away, even in the face of suffering and affliction. What is Paul's truth? Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that we looked at last week. The secret, has been secret since the world began. Nobody knew it previously. But now it's made manifest. He says, I want you to know something. My gospel, it was held secret until revealed to me by Christ, and now I'm revealing that truth to you. That means the Old Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, early Acts, had no clue what Paul's gospel was about. Amen. Galatians 1, 11 and 12. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after a man, for I neither received it of man. Neither was I taught it, but by the personal appearing to me, revelation of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 3, 2. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. As I wrote afore in a few words. Then he says in verse 5. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his apostles, prophets, by the Spirit. Verses 8, And to me, whom less than the least of all saints, I don't know why God chose me to do this, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable, untraceable riches of Christ, and to make all men see my responsibility, I want people to know what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now and to the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. It's our responsibility to hold on to this mystery truth, the body of Christ, those truths I shared with you last week, and don't let them slip. 1 Corinthians 1.25 1 Corinthians 1.25 Wherefore I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations but now is made manifest to his saints. That's Paul's truth. He said, listen believers, you get a hold of these truths. What he's saying about the mystery program that's different from the prophetic program that's to Israel, yours is to the body of Christ for today. Get a hold of it. Stand fast with it. Don't let it slip. Don't lose it. And then he gives a warning. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of sin, rebuke, rebuke. Uh, Exhort with all long suffering doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. 
Is that not the day, by the way? You know, people would rather have goosebumps than have truth. I just said a lot right there. And notice, they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall heap themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. They will give you false, watered-down teachings, teachings that are not offensive, not churchy, feeling-oriented, devotionalized faith, experience-driven, man's opinion, psychology, theology. We're all victims. Purpose-driven, non-threatening, feel-good, emergent. Emergent has the idea to destroy what the Bible says now and then to reinterpret it and make it mean what they want it to mean. That's what's going on in our nation right now. They want to destroy everything and then come up with something they think should be. Same thing with the Word of God. Now here's the big good one. The Word, interpretation less. Today you do not hear people interpreting the Bible. Who said it? Why? When? Why? What? Where? <laughs> they don't interpret it for us. They take it and they go off somewhere and give their own teachings rather than interpreting it. Paul's fulfillment. This came to pass even during Paul's days, 2 Timothy 1.15. This thou knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. Those churches I started, they've let it slip through their hands. 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved of the God, a workman that is not to be shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase and do more ungodliness and so on. And he mentions a couple of fellows. That's exactly what's going on today. Paul's persistence. Now I'm coming down the stretch. Paul's persistence. 2 Timothy 4, verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. God had not forgotten Paul. And let me just say something to you. If you hold on to truth, God won't forget you either. Notice, go back to verse 7 if you would. Verse 7, notice his declaration. He says, I have fought a good fight. What confronted, when confronted, put down for standing for the truth, I want you to know something. I contended, I agonized, I struggled, I boxed and wrestled opponents to the mysteries gospel of grace. I've done the best I possibly could do. Verse 7 also, notice, he says, I have finished my course. There we see his determination. He's saying, listen, I followed God's calling, his will for my life. And what is his will for his life? You don't have to turn to it, fellas, in Acts 20, but the gospel of the grace of God. He didn't allow it to slip. I've completed the task God wanted me to accomplish. I've won souls. I've taught doctrine, and I've written scripture. And then he says in verse 7, I have kept the faith. There we see his dedication. I've kept the body of truth, the pure truth of the mystery revealed to me by Christ. That program that has been entrusted to me, I held it. I held it fast. And in verse 8, we see Paul's reward. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also, that love his appearing. For his standing and unwavering faith in God, his, his, what, truth of the mystery program, Paul received the prize. And he says, you'll receive it if you stand fast with it too. I tell you today, people, it will be worth it all one day. I promise you that. Paul's message, there needs to be believers 
who will stand up and follow the body program, the mystery program. And God is now even asking people to pick it up. I told you before about the movie Hang Em High with Clint Eastwood. How many of you have seen that? Saved people saw it. (laughs) And he was hoodwinked by some cattle thieves. He was upset the way justice had handled his case. But the judge said to him, Cooper, pick up the badge. Do it the right way. Pick up the badge or leave justice to us. And by the way, aren't you so disappointed after you hear preachers after preachers on television and they never talk about Pauline Truth Harley at all? Isn't it amazing? God's asking us to pick up Paul's message of grace. It might not be easy, but if you pick this up, I want you to know something. I'll be with you, and we can turn this upside down for my glory. I promise you something, an eternal prize. But I want you to understand something. God says, I can't use you if you live a hit-and-miss life for Christ. I have a hard time to use you if you put business and sports ahead of him and you're controlled by the cares of this world. (coughs) That was for COVID. (laughs) (coughs) But he does ask those individual believers who are willing to surrender to their lives to him. People who have, like J.C. O'Hare, Dr. Cornelius Stamm, Les Felick, Richard Jordan, Paul Sadler, Keith Blades, Charles Baker, Joe Fink, Ricky Kurth, Terrence McLean. He might have been rough, but he believed what he believed. He just died here last week. And other grace believers. God's looking to give Paul's grace message to some people, to some people who will be courageous, unafraid, bold, faithful, humble, unmovable in grace, uncompromising of truth, willing to learn, being totally dependent upon the Lord. Often it's been said, where's the God of the Bible? But where is the believer who has counted the cost? Understanding there's going to be attacks, put-downs, criticisms, ostracizing, hardship. But still that believer in Christian Pauline truth says, Here I am, Lord. All of me is yours. I'm willing to stand and defend Paul's message of grace. Paul says, Stand fast. Stay faithful at your post. Another one of my old ones that Rachel has heard 1,600 times. In the old days, an elderly missionary lady, she was a veteran, was retiring. She interviewed several young lady candidates who would replace her. And they asked, how many hours a week would this be? And what kind of retirement program they had, and on and on. After interviewing them, she wrote back to the field office and said, don't sell my mule, I'm staying. (laughs) She knew it couldn't work with them. Do you understand that rightly dividing the mystery program, there's not a whole lot of people willing to stand up and pay the cost. We have come to a point within Christianity that Christians have it too easy, Christians Uh, are lukewarm. Christians are just, they don't want to be inconvenienced today, do they? Rather than saying, God, I believe this truth because it's in the Bible. God, however, whatever way you can use me, I'm available. 
I don't know what that means, God, but I know this. I love you. I know I want to give you my all because of what you've done for me. And here's my life. I didn't grab a hold of this message until after 28 years as a Baptist pastor. My last year, I began to grasp it, and I began to teach it some in the church, and then we left, and I began to build on that, and then we started our church. As Paul Sadler said, learning the revelation of the mystery program and how it fits in Scripture and all this, he said, it's like getting saved all over again. <laughs> and that's true. And I just, uh, I just say to you, listen, God needs and wants some people who are willing to hold fast this truth. Regardless of what people might say, hold fast to the truth. Don't let it go. They lost it almost one time back in history. And it seems like we picked up some now. We can't allow it to be lost again. We have to hold on to it. And so I challenge you people that come to our church, don't ever be ashamed of it. Get in it, dig, find out for yourself. Get firsthand revelation yourself, and it'll change your life. Father, we love you. We thank you for grace. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the Holy Spirit working in our lives. We thank you for the word of God you've given us to help guide us and direct us in the right path. And we just praise you and give you glory today in Jesus' name. And everybody said? We hope that you received a blessing from today's broadcast. We would love to have you to visit us in person. You can watch us live and view past services on our website at gpnd.net. For more information, please visit our website or contact us by phone. Until next week, may God richly bless you as our prayer.